All right, everybody, welcome to the He Man or Dance Art. We're doing it. We're doing it remotely. We're doing a guest. We're doing a lot of degrees of difficulty here. Um, I love to have this guy on. I've been wanting to get him on the pod for a while. One of my favorite stand ups working today, Joe List. We'll, we'll clap for whoever. You can clap at home. <laughs> he has a great special that's out on YouTube right now. You got to check it out. It's on Comedy Central's YouTube. It's called I Hate Myself, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely check it out. And I love this new wave of just specials that. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the access is there for the fans. Like everyone has YouTube. It's like running water. That's more important than anything, you know, cause people will have specials on epics and stuff and it's great. But, uh, I think it's so cool how like yours is on YouTube. Norman's is on YouTube and uh, people get to see it. That selfishly as a comedy fan, it, it's great. And obviously I'm a fan of yours. So Joe list, everybody welcome to the program. Thank you very Welcome. much. That was a that was a great intro. I appreciate it, and 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 all those things. I feel the same about uh, about you. So well, that's nice. Thanks, man. All right, let's. That, I think we'd wrap it up. I think we did. All right. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's that. Pod, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> We're condensing. Just my podcast is just going to be straight up intros to, to to my friends and comics I like. But yeah, you're in New York right now, and I have so many questions about that. But right now, sort of like. Uh, what is stand up like in New York currently? I know what it's like in LA, but I'm, I'm in the dark with what's going on in, in New York. Well, so it's weird. I guess stand up is different for a lot of different people. I'm not doing anything, I'm just sitting here. Stand up comedy now for me is doing podcasts. That's, that's like the closest. <laughs> this is like a set. I'm like, I got a show tonight, baby. <laughs> um, but some people, there are shows that are happening like i think there's an like next weekend i'm doing a couple outdoor shows with like there's heaters they're on rooftops and there's like heaters oh, wow. and people wear blankets and shit um during the summer it was great like we were running around doing sets and then for a while the cellar was like kind of open they were open for dinner but then like there'd be a comedian talking while people ate dinner mm -hmm. um so you could run around doing sets during the summer now it's definitely a, a, a little different um i haven't done a set in a while but i know there are shows that are happening and i keep laughing because there's like all these young comics that are like hungry that are like getting after it they're like fuck COVID, i gotta live my dreams and so you see like a lineup and there's just people i'm like who are these people i've never heard of any of these people um because all these newer comics are, are like i'll take any opportunity i can get to get on stage and it actually, we keep, my wife and I, is, she's a comic. We keep laughing. I'm like, I think comedians are moving here during this. Like, oh. I've met comics that are like, hey, I'm, I'm Steve. I'm, I'm a comedian. I just moved here. And you're like, what? Um, so, yeah, there's comedy happening, but I'm not doing much of it. When's the last time you went up? Um, boy, that's a great question. Um, uh, boy, I'm trying to think. I've done a couple Zoom things, but I guess maybe like a month ago or something. Yeah, it must be a month ago. I did a show in Brooklyn, like on a rooftop. It was freezing uh, and it was pretty good. But, and I got a couple sets next week, but yeah, I think it's been over a month. Huh. So it's going to be rooftop stuff, the, the things that you have n next week or whatever? Yeah, yeah, they're like rooftop shit. Oh God, my storage is full of my phone. Fuck, sorry. That's all right, that's all right. We'll work with the technical difficulties. So what uh, do we do? Shit. We'll, we'll, we'll just shift to Zoom, I guess, or keep it going on Zoom. Because it, it's yeah. going to be too hard to clear that much space on your phone, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I didn't... We could just stick to Zoom. Yeah, as I long as our audio... Fine. As long as his audio is going, then that's yeah. fantastic. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. This, no, I mean, this... No, no, a, the the this computer looks camera looks yeah. just as good. Yeah. It looks yeah, fine. I, I suck. I hate my <laughs> face. But, um, but uh, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, I think it's all rooftop -y things. There might be a couple, like, secretly indoor things that are happening, but I, I haven't... Dunham, I'm not sure about that. Are you doing the road at all? Are you itching to get on the road? Or are you just kind of waiting it out in New York and taking it as God's way to say pause for a bit? Because you're like a go, go, go guy. You love stand up and you, you were on the road quite a bit, huh? Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing is kind of enjoying it. Like I, I've been on the road for like I've been doing comedy for 20 years, which is insane. And then I've been working the road since like, oh, like pretty consistently since 06. So and then the last few years I've done like 40, 45 weeks on the road. And uh, I was definitely burnt out. Like I last September through December, I did 17 consecutive weeks on the road, like home and back home for three, gone for four. And um, right before everything shut down, I was about to go like to, I think it was like Austin, Vegas, LA, Australia, and back to Boston before going home. So it was kind of, oh. um, 
well timed in a way to get, to get the break. So right now I'm kind of embracing the idea that we will go back to normal. I'll be back to working every night and every week, but we'll never come back to something like this. Hopefully, knock on wood, where mm-hmm. where like literally people are like it's heroic to not work. So I'm like, oh, great. All right. Like the best thing you can do for humans is to stay home. I'm like, all right, kick ass, man. I'll do that. That sounds fun. Yeah. You're like, that's right up my alley. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And then just doing tons of podcasts and I've gone on trips and stuff. Like my wife and I have gone on a bunch of hiking trips and we've seen friends like we're we're not totally hunkered down. We just, you know, we isolate from other assholes. I'm wondering because because you're a guy obviously who's like stringing together a bunch of dates and you love doing stand up and just just the whole 17 weeks on pretty much like having this break. I've learned some things about myself and I'm wondering, did you have any epiphanies once you had this much time and sort of your routine was broken? What did you learn about yourself and kind of like life, I guess, because that's always interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. Like, well. I was always, I've always been like a, a meditator and I was going to therapy and like trying to stay mentally healthy as possible. I'm really into Buddhism and I'm always reading all these Buddhist books and psychology books. But on this break, I've gotten like a really good meditation practice in my life. Like every morning, I start every morning with like a, a meditation, a guided meditation, and then um, I go for like a long sort of wa- meditative walk and start my day with a cup of tea. And I, I started leaving my phone outside of my bedroom so I don't look at it before bed and I don't look at it right away in the morning. And those are all things that I, I only started doing during pandemic that I'm like, I got to carry this with me going back into um, regular life when it is regular life or if it is whatever. Um, yeah, those things have been really helpful and then also understanding i had that thing of like you got to keep working it man like you can't take a day like i would take one night off and be like all right i gotta get back or else i'm gonna suck and then i took three months off and then you kind of you're fine like i i think once you're as far in as we are you're like i have a pretty good foundation of of comedy i'll be fine so the idea of like you can take some time off and it's fine is like a new idea to me Huh. That, that's pretty powerful. Uh, I wouldn't think that you would have that being such like a workhorse, you know, because like I think you, you're better at that than I am. Because at the beginning, I was like, I had this moment of what am I if I'm not doing this? Just so much of my identity was kind of wrapped in my profession. Just like, oh, right. I, I do. I do stand up at night and I, I do these things. And then once you don't do those things, you have to find a new identity or you have to dig a little deeper and you go, OK, I have to be more than this this thing that I've put water in. Right. Well, your stuff is so great that you've been doing um, online is like hilarious. And so I've been trying lately to do a little more um, sketch and some video stuff. And I have this thing where I like hate myself, where I do, um, you know, I have now three podcasts, one that I added during pandemic just recently. And but I, I have this thing where I'm like, you're a piece of shit. This isn't art. I'm like, what is this? I'm just like talking with my buddy. This is stupid. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a musician. I did none of those things. So I definitely have a lot of that. Um, and like when we first stopped, I was like, all right, here we go. I'm going to write the movie. I'm going to write a book. And <laughs> I started. Bread? I, I started. To, well, I started to write a book. I was like, I'm going to write a book. I have all these like amazing stories. And I talked to my agent and he hooked me up with like a literary agent. And I was like, ah, I'm on it, man. I'm, I'm doing it. And I wrote like a 22 page book proposal. And then oh. the agent was, couldn't have been nicer. and was just criticized, like giving me constructive <laughs> criticism. She's like, it's a little bit this we got to. And like, as she's talking, I'm like, I can't write a book. Who are we kidding? What am I talking about? I'm not a book guy. I'm a podcast guy. What are you shitting me? Like, I, I don't know what I thought I was going to write a book. And so I just com- came apart at the seams. So I do think sometimes I'm like stand-up comedy and podcasting are not easy, but they're the easiest things to me. I'm like, I, it's easy. I can write a joke and then go tell it on stage. But like writing a movie or a sketch or, or a book, uh, that's scary. I don't know how I got into that. I just started like no. unraveling here. No, I like that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I totally get that too. Just sort of gravitating towards your core competencies. Cause I'll have <laughs> dreams of like, yeah, I'm going to bang out a movie or I'm, this is a great <laughs> idea for a movie. I have so many great ideas for movies. And then when you got to put pen to paper, you'll hear about, you know, I was watching this thing with Seth Rogen on, there's this show called off camera with Sam Jones. And there's a real, there's great clips of, you know, they'll have different guests like actors and directors and comedians. And even just hearing Seth Rogen, who you 
envisioned to be a very successful movie producer and writer and all this stuff. He's talking about how long, like, uh, this is the end. He's like, that took three years to make. So that's someone who's good at what they do, and it takes three years. Just show, it's just such a process, and I'm so used to the immediacy of stand-up or the immediacy of sketch. And whenever I try to do something a little more outside of my comfort zone, I'm like, oh, this is taking so long. I could have a joke. Mm. It, I could come exactly. up with 20 jokes. It, exactly. That's exactly how I feel. And like, this is something I have to like work on in therapy and every other thing I try to do to improve myself. But my thing is always like, if whatever it was stand up, you can write all day and then go say everything you wrote that night and figure out if it works. But I'm like, I'm, like you said, like if, if I'm writing a movie, it takes me like nine months and then nobody ever makes it. It's just nothing. I'm like, I fucking wasted my whole life. Um, and my therapist is like, well, you're doing what you're doing is a valuable use of time. You don't write it so you can make it. You write it because you're creating and whatever other bullshit he says. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, I, I definitely stand up or our podcasting is like, ah, I'm talking and we're, 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 this is a conversation. Someone will listen to it. I'm sure hopefully someone will enjoy it. It just seems easier to me than writing a movie. But then I get like John Hughes wrote Ferris Bueller's day off in six days. They always <laughs> say that. And yeah. I'm like, all right, all right. I'm going to do the six-day movie thing. <laughs> <laughs> that movie's good. I mean, it, 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 you, yeah. you, realize, you realize, though, that like, that's bursting out of that person, you know? It's sort of like you have jokes bursting out of you, and you're, you just have to sort of uh, catch them. And I think right. that, that's how some people are with movies, and I'm envious of that, but it's a little, it's a little different. Yeah, and, and my, I, I told it to my therapist one time, and he was like, well, it probably wasn't his first movie. And you're like... No, no, that's a good point. Like, like it wasn't his debut. Like, he was just like, movie. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah. Um, what about you, Ollie? On the because like Ollie's a filmmaker. In have you worked on movies? Have you like? Is it tough writing, doing pen to paper, the idea versus the execution? Yeah, and and I feel like any kind of writer can attest to it that like, the hardest thing is just looking at that blank final draft, and writing interior or exterior just that's the hardest but um because i started that i started doing the short film that like we were gonna shoot but through like right at the beginning of quarantine but you could kind of get lo i will i got like just i i've been overthinking it too much i'd write like three four five scenes or like a whole draft and be like now nah, fuck this back to square one and then it's like all right fuck this back to square one but if a guy like you know like john hughes would just be like boom this is it who knows if he even took notes or if he even like looked back and be like is there any depth to these characters i don't know you know like it just you just kind of some people have that natural instinct to just be like no nah, this is perfect as is let's take this in you know get this shot so some people have that talent and you know some people just work on it like him you know like he was what he was doing like um mad what was like mad tv magazine or whatever um or oh he worked at mad mad magazine john hughes i think so yeah i think he was doing that for for and then oh national lampoon yeah and then he tra transitioned into uh into filmmaking but yeah you, you look at those guys and you're just like shit i'll never do, be able to do something of that would, caliber yeah when you first got into stand-up joe like were you trying to do anything else like because some people get into stand-up to to act or they get into it to, to like direct was that ever uh an angle because you're such a pure stand-up so I've heard you on other podcasts as well just talk about how you're like I've made it baby this is all I want to do I just want to like do <laughs> weekends and just do stand-up is that something you settled into or or did you have like other things you wanted to do early on yeah it's weird it's kind of like I mean I always wanted to be a, a filmmaker like when I was a kid I loved stand-up but I wanted to be Martin Scorsese like that's who I wanted mm -hmm. to be um but again it's like that seemed way harder. I'm like, I, I don't even understand. Like, I got to go to NYU. I can't get into <laughs> NYU. You know what I mean? I'm like, that's not going to work. And you had to like, a lot of this is laziness and, and probably some alcoholism in there too. But like, I'm like, I, what am I, I, I write a script. I got to go to film school and all this shit. So, uh, and then I thought like, maybe, I, I remember George Carlin said this in an interview. I've always had this feeling of like, Louis seemed like he kind of pulled it off and Chris, those guys can pull it off where like, if I just get good enough at stand-up and successful enough at stand-up, then they'll put me in a movie. And then once I'm in a movie, then I think you can just say, I'm going to direct a movie now. I mean, I feel like that's what 
Mel Gibson did that, you know. <laughs> I mean, like I, I, I yeah. thought if I if I can get big enough with stand up, maybe they'll let me do something like that. Um, but practically speaking, I never really pursued any of that. I have this thing where I always want to be things, but never pursue it. Even in, inside of stand-up comedy, I remember being like so bitter that I was like, I've never done a late night. All these guys have late nights. And it was like an epiphany that I was like, oh, I've actually never attempted to get on a late night show. <laughs> like I wanted the booker of Letterman to knock on my door and be like, hey, come on, hey, come here, put a suit on. Um, so uh, yeah, I never pursued a lot of these things that I should start pursuing. And then this year... I, I told you, I started writing a movie and I got like 84 pages into it. And I was talking to a uh, oh. a friend of mine who's like a, a, a filmmaker and a, a famous a person with some money and he's made films. And he started talking. He's like, we could make this. And we got like, I got all excited. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm going to make a movie. And then uh, he kind of faded on the idea. And then after that, I was like, all right, forget it. So um, that person ruined my dreams and my movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so hard though to to get that interest and then to keep that ball in the air, because it's hard enough to make that contact. But uh, there is this sort of enthusiasm for a project that can wane. I've had that happen before, where everyone's all about it, and then you live your life, and and then you just lose that air. So what was? It, it's all about like a moment in time as well. Like it has to be perfect timing, and and everyone yeah. has to be on board. Exactly. And then like I can just get so disheartened. It's like the book and the movie are both the same story, basically. Basically, I have no uh, perseverance or resilience to what's whatsoever. <laughs> I'm just like, nah, I, I, I'll yeah. just wait it out. I love the Letterman thing where you're so upset and you realize, well, I haven't even taken any steps towards this thing. Yeah. And, and then when I did, I managed to do it. You know, you're like, so... Because I, I think that, of you as a guy who's done so many late nights, you know? So it's, it's really refreshing to hear you say that, to be like, oh, man, I'm so jealous that I had no late, light, or late nights. And I've, I just imagine you've done like hundreds of them. Yeah, I mean, I've done a bunch now, but it was like, f I was 14 years in when I did my first one. So there was a lot of like, that guy, he was only five years in. And you're like, yeah, he probably sent mm. the tape. He probably put together a tape and sent it to somebody. That's how he did that. Oh, God. Did I ruin it? What happened? No, 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 no. <laughs> Ollie, hop in. You got no, the great no. Joe list on, um, Ollie. Don't waste them. Come on. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I got worried that I just ruined the whole party. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 I felt like you're, you're going to elaborate on that and that experience, you know? So, okay. There's this moment where you finally do get that moment, you know? Like, you're finally in. You get accepted to do your first late night. When you're there, is it kind of like... I just want to kind of get this done and over with. Are you there being like, I'm going to take a moment and take everything in because who knows if this will ever happen again. Like that first time that you're kind of in there. And yeah. Who was, who was your first? Uh, Letterman. Yeah. Letterman. Wow. It, yeah. And it was, it was interesting because I pursued doing that and then it took forever. It took like a, over a year bet between like the first time meeting the bookers and then being like, yeah, send us a tape to getting on was like a year and a half because um, I kept sending them tapes. And then it was funny. At one point I sent them, they were like, that McDonald's joke, we love that joke. And I was like, well, can I just trash McDonald's on TV? And they're like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> and then like four months passed. And they're like, okay, you can't do the McDonald's joke. They're a sponsor. And I was like, yeah, I told you that. <laughs> I was the one that was like, I thought we couldn't do that. But anyway, it went back and forth for so long. And in that process he announced he was uh, retiring. And so then I was like, fuck, there's no way I'm going to get on now. And because it became like this um, retirement, all these people were coming on, all these big stars were coming on and, and um, they kind of went like radio silent for like a couple months. And my manager at the time was like, hey, I think we have to move on. They're not responding. And I've, I've never asserted myself my whole life, but I was like, no. I was like, get them to say no. I wanted them to email me saying never mind forget it because at that point they had already made it seem like i was going to do the show and i was like i want it in writing tell them like i want a, an email saying forget it we we pulled him along and now we're not having him and she was like okay i'll i'll write to them and then the next email was a date so it really worked oh, wow. out to be like are you i just like couldn't imagine that i was going to get ghosted after like 14 months of going back and forth with these guys 
Um, and I think I could be wrong. There might have been one more. I think I was the last comedian to debut on the show. Like there was comedians that came after me. Like Norm did a set, and I think Seinfeld. But I might be wrong. But I think I might have been the last guy to um, do his first appearance on the Letterman show. Um, oh, wow. But yeah. So, anyways, it was it was amazing, and yeah, I, I remember it pretty well. But I, I was definitely really nervous. But I think I was pretty in the moment for it. I got a lot of like good advice from people and. Um, what was yeah, the advice? I'm good. very curious, you know, um, that experience for you and also the advice you got and how you attack a late night. What is your process to gear up for that? So I try to like, I run the set a bunch. So like, you know it front and back, but then I've always take, I've done five now and I always take the night before off and just like chill. Uh, so it feels kind of fresh-ish, ish, fresh-ish. Um, <laughs> But the best advice I got was from Nick Griffin, who's like a brilliant comic. I don't know if he's done Letterman. I think, I don't know how many times he did it. I think 14 times or wow. something like wow. that. He did it a lot. Nine times. I think he did it nine times. Um, but um, he gave me the best of it because I kept asking everyone, like, what do you do? What, what? And then he say, he's like, my advice is you don't need my advice. He's like, you're great. It's going to be great. He's like, they're like the hottest crowd ever. Nobody has bad sets on there. Uh, you just do your act. He's like, you don't, you don't need anything from me. And it was actually like a really um, brilliant piece of advice because I was putting myself in this position of like, somebody help me. I, I can't do it. Like, help me. Wh what do you do? What did you do? And he was like, you don't need any. What do you need from me? He's like, you just do your set. And again, at the time I was, you know, 14 years into comedy. It's like, you're just doing a five minute set. And the crowd is like completely on your side. So that was like hugely helpful to be like, right, what am I doing? Why am I asking people for all this advice? Um, and then there's a comic, Moody McCarthy, that gave me good advice that he just said, he's like, he said two things that were helpful. He's like, the sound is weird in the room. Like there's no monitor. So it's going to feel like they can't hear you, but they can. Well, I, I don't know the science behind it, but yeah. that was true. It felt like I was just talking like the way I'm talking to you guys. Right. And then he also said, Paul Schaefer, the musician, is sitting like three feet from you. So you're going to hear him laugh, but also know that he is still conducting the band. So he has to like get stuff ready. So if you don't hear him laugh, don't be thrown. He's just doing something. And that actually helped me because in the moment, like I was hearing him laugh. And then like the second half of my set, I was like, hey, where'd Paul go? <laughs> and I actually consciously was like, all right, he's, he's got shit to do. He's doing something. Don't worry about that. Um, so those were both really... Um, helpful things and uh yeah it was it was great i mean it was like magical your first late night is like uh, it was really meaningful to me D and also when you, you look back after you oh sorry go Ollie. no uh a lot of you know like when you look back is the night clear or was it has it been like a fuzz has it been you know or did you kind of like erase that thought or that memory no it's really clear that one's really clear a lot of the other ones kind of it takes more effort to think about where I okay. was and I've done Conan a couple times and I can kind of conflate those memories of like who was at that one who were the guests on that one but Letterman's definitely the clearest like I know the date I know who else was on and oh, and wow. all that stuff and who was with me because it, it just for me I, I had been doing comedy for a long time and I had just gotten sober and for me it was like I had this sort of um narrative that I was like this lovable loser I could never mm. get a break and I was just a a loser idiot and it felt like i was finally like winning <laughs> and um and again a lot of that is goes hand in hand with just drinking and not making much effort it, it turns out when you try you can really <laughs> be much more successful but at the time it felt like oh man this is a this is like magical um yeah. but yeah so it would that was definitely the most memorable one and it's pretty clear like i can remember most of the moments in there i also am like have severe anxiety and i've had like a history of panic attacks so i was really nervous that i was going to have a panic attack and wouldn't be able to go out there um wow. but um i just remember i kept thinking like all right i'm not freaking out yet and then uh all of a sudden it's like time to go on you're like all right i guess i'm gonna be fine yeah, for this yeah yeah so you were cool behind the curtain and all that yeah it's it's interesting Later, I had I did a Conan where I was like really anxious, but the Letterman thing, I've somehow got into this really zen spot 
where I was like, all right, right now, and this is the best, this is the best way to live. I was like, right now I'm just in the green room. I don't need to worry. I'm just sitting in the green room with friends. And then I remember having the feeling of like, okay, right now I'm just taking an elevator down to where this show is. That's not a big deal. I'm just standing on an elevator. And then I was like, right now I'm just backstage. So that's not a big deal. And then it was time to go out. And I was like, okay, right now I'm just walking to my spot. That's easy. And then you get to the first joke and you're like, all right, well, just say the first joke. That's not a big deal. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're like, oh, I'm halfway through. This is, this is easy. Um, oh, man. So I, I kind of down. managed. Yeah, I got really in the moment and I haven't been back in the moment since. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, for that day, it was great. There's something strange because even for my first late night, I was I think I was more Zen than I than I've been on all of them. There's just something about I think because I had wanted it for so long as well. And then I remember being behind the curtain for Seth and in my mind, I'm like, this is the moment, I guess, if anyone was going to freak out, this would be the time to do it, to be behind the curtain and all that. But then I had been doing stand up for a long time as well before I got my first late night. And I was like, I've done a million sets. I just sort of like had this little conversation with myself. I wasn't spinning out or anything, but I just sort of, it was kind of nice to just do the countdown and wait and just be like, I've been doing stand up for so long. Uh, there's no reason to have any nervous feelings whatsoever because, like, if not me, then who? You know, it's like a helicopter pilot doesn't get nervous about flying a helicopter. You're like, you're more equipped to do this than a large percentage of comedians. And that kind of just, I don't know, let's just have fun. It's almost a celebration of all the work you've put up until this moment. Yeah. It's just, it's just another set. Exactly. And it's a set where, like, the crowd wants you to do great. Like uh, that's the thing to remember too with late night sets, is that everybody there, it's a huge deal for them. They're like, mm. "This is unbelievable. We're at we're at the late show." You know what I mean? Like, th there's no one drunk. There's no drunk assholes there. There's no one there that wants to be part of the show. They're like, "This is special. We're going to see." And I always think too. I I think there's a re like sometimes you'll see a comic do a joke about being poor on TV, and I'm like, I don't know if that's gonna work because the audience thinks. I think regular people think if you're on late night, they're paying you $50,000 to be on there. Because yeah. they're like, that was Tom Hanks. Here's Joe Lynn. Like, they're like, this guy must be a millionaire. Yeah, you forget <laughs> that. That uh, you have this disassociation because we're like the lowest rung on the entertainment ladder. And being stand-ups, our green rooms are like in in like the alcohol closet just like we've been treated <laughs> we've been treated like shit for so long throughout our careers that that you start to it seeps into you and you have that that mentality for so long even when you climb through the ranks of hollywood so even when you're on a show that tom hanks is on and all that you still think like i'm garbage but the crowd <laughs> just sees you on a couch with tom hanks or whatever so they're like what are you talking about yeah they're like this is amazing and i i also i do remember this on letterman too the whatever like whatever his job i guess he's like a stagehand he opens the curtain he's like he's just like a, a union guy you know and like he's chatting me up he's like i say you're from boston huh are you a patriots fan and i'm like this is insane i'm like i'm about to go on like shut up yeah. but it actually helped me take me into this conversation because i'm looking at his face and having a dialogue and i remember it occurred to me that it's like oh i'm the most nervous person in this building like letterman's doing his seven thousandth show the audience is just an audience all the stagehands this is just their job and then the celebrities don't give a shit. They're just popping in to whatever, uh, promote their movies. So you're like, I'm like the only person in this building that's nervous. Um, which there's something fun about that too. Uh, but it actually strangely helped me to like take me out of the anxiety and into the moment of just talking about the you know football with yeah. some meatball. And this realization that this isn't the most precious thing in the universe. You realize that this is, you're on a timeline of, of this has been done millions of times before and million times after you and, and just the fact that they're so nonchalant you forget that oh this is just a workplace <laughs> you know <laughs> you've put it up here in your mind like this is the most important thing in the world but you forget this is just like tuesday and they want the weekend to come around yeah that, exactly and that's like the sentiment i got from nick griffin who's like yeah you don't you don't need me like he was almost like dumbfounded he was like yeah what do i don't know <laughs> just go do your job it's just a show man uh, he wasn't being like uh, shitty about it. He was just like, yeah, you don't, you don't need anything from me. It's fine. And then also you're like, it's five minutes. Like a, like a, a, a cleaning at the dentist is three times longer than a late night set. <laughs> That's a good point. Someone had a cool quote. I think when I was, um, I was taking the elevator to do Seth or whatever to like get there on the floor. And then 
someone said it was a cool way of looking at a late night. They go, NBC is like you, you're on NBC is like letting you rent five minutes of their station or, you know what I mean? Like it's a crazy yeah. concept. Like you're only doing five minutes and you're doing stand up and all that. But for those five minutes, you are the captain of NBC. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. Yeah, I, I love that. Jay Leno said something similar on Comedians in Cars. They were talking, and I forever love Leno for this. Um, I don't know him personally. I don't know. You might see him around, but um, I, I, I love hearing him on interviews, but he's on um, Comedians in Cars, and Seinfeld, who frustrates me, I love him as an <laughs> artist, but whenever I hear him, I'm like, oh, jeez. But he was saying, he's like, don't you feel bad for these young comics that don't know what it's like to do Carson, to do a real or whatever? And Leno was like, no, it's the same. He, he was, and Leno made me laugh because he's like, I see these guys before they go on. They come back and they go, hello, Mr. Leno. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> so funny. He's like, I can't believe this. And, and I appreciate Leno because I'm like, well, the feeling is the same. Like we're still... I'm still shitting my pants, even though I might not get a sitcom the next day. I'm still scared, and I still want it to go well. But he said the same thing. He was like, I "Actually, it might have been Jerry. I think it was Jay though that said, for those five minutes, you you are the network. Like you're the only person on there. And you think about, uh, you know, the Tonight Show. It's like NBC. Like, you know, Seinfeld, the TV show was on this, or you're on CBS. Like Walter Cronkite." told america that john f kennedy was killed and on that you're on that same timeline of you being like oh dogs are weird <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is you know there is f five minutes in the history of nbc or cbs that is just you standing there it's pretty amazing yeah, mind-boggling that the network trusts you for five minutes to helmet that, that's yeah. a cool way i'm wondering after you did the late nights did things become easier at all like getting weekends and stuff and and doing the row did you find like doors open a little bit or was it just like a thing to do I think, I don't know. I think it was more, it took a while longer for me. Like I still featured for a while uh, after doing Letterman. Um, it's weird. I, late night, that is the thing that, that Seinfeld was kind of talking about, I guess, was late night now, it just feels like you got a really good tape. <laughs> like It's <laughs> like, it's something cool to show your parents or whatever. And it's a fun day. But, um, and it, it ultimately it helps. I've The way I heard it put from somebody, like an agent or somebody was like, it gives the club something to point to in case you suck. Like they can be like, no, no. If, if someone's like, I want my money back. This guy sucks. You can be like, no, look at him. He's on the tonight show. You, you stink. Um, it, it gives clubs a good clip to play. And it, it does, it feels like at least legitimizes you. And for me, it's like fun. I know there's a lot of people that are like anti late night. I remember hearing Rogan talk about it's stupid and comics shouldn't do it or whatever, but I'm like, but it's fun. It's exciting. I like doing it. Yeah. Oh, what's I'm sorry. What's what's the the logic or what's the reasoning behind late night not being appealing for comedians or for them not to do I, it? I, I think. think sir, oh yeah, okay. you go. No, you go ahead, Fahim. Uh, my, you get my, in trouble. My, my theory <laughs> on it is is just that uh, maybe their style breathes a little more, and maybe like the confines of a five minute late night they would have to tinker too much with what they do to get it to fit. Whereas I, I think Joe's built for late night as well, you know? Yeah. I, th I, th I think like, yeah, I think you get to a, a higher level. Like certainly um, those bigger guys are like, why I understand, I understand it. Cause it's like, you do have to submit your jokes and sometimes you have to type them all out and then have somebody go, no, could you use this word or you could change this to that. And it doesn't have nearly the the payoff. Like at this point, a lot of people have enough YouTube followers. They could just put together a five minute set and put it on their YouTube and it would get more views than, um, you know, doing James Corden or whatever. So I do understand it. And like, you know, maybe it doesn't pay as much as it should or, or whatever. I, I understand it to some degree. Um, and and some, there's some comics that are like, what's the point of going through all that trouble and to do this kind of corporate thing? Uh, but to me, I'm like, I like the experience. I like putting on a suit and meeting the celebrities that are on the show and having your friends watch. And uh, it's exciting. It, it feels like you're in show. But I mean, for me, like you said, like I'm usually at the funny bone eating chicken wings in a closet. So like those nights that you get to be like, I I'm on the show, I'm on TV. It's pretty it's it's fun to me. It's a fun experience. 
I've almost noticed too, it's, it feels like it's a re-upping your relevancy as well. You know how maybe sometimes in Hollywood you feel like, or just entertainment and showbiz, you're only as good as your last fight or your last credit. So when you do a late night, you're like, okay, I've got a little more gas in the tank. Yeah, hundred percent. Whereas if it's been, <laughs> yeah. Hundred hundred percent, yeah. And, it, it, and, and even just for getting booked in clubs, it feels like I did a late night a couple of weeks ago, not just four years ago or whatever. So yeah, it definitely does feel like it makes you it makes you feel legitimate a, a little bit I, now i i read that uh you did the i didn't know you did this the seattle international competition huh yeah i did that in 2010 were you there were well, you around I'm from there so i'm uh, i started stand-up in seattle so i i know carl ron reed and and the comedy underground is one of my first clubs i think it's, it's the first place i ever did stand-up actually um, wow not the new location because they they, sh they moved to like a new part of pioneer square but the original comedy underground, I remember seeing Louie there like back when he was nobody. He was just a touring comic and he was one of my favorites and he would come through. Um, but yeah, they would always try to get me to do the Seattle International, but I was going to engineering school and it was just such a grueling schedule. And they went all around Washington State that it was just hard for me. I was like, I can't do it, guys. It's just it's so grueling and I, I, have, I have class. I can't do it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, grueling is the right word. It's weird. I mean, we kept joking. They should call it the Pacific Northwest Comedy Competition <laughs> because I think only like two of the shows were in Seattle and, and one of them was in like Bellingham and Everett. I think, is it Bellingham? One of them was like almost Canada. I mean, it yeah, was yeah, like... Yeah, that's Bellingham. It was way up there and I got so fortunate. So Seattle's like a second home to me. My best friend from high school... Um, he lives in West Seattle, and so I spend a lot of time there. And so he lived there, and he had an extra car, not an extra car, but he lived close enough that he could bike to work, um, or I would drop him off, whatever. Like He was like, I don't need a car to get to work. So I used his car, so I had a free car and a free place to stay. And then that festival, there's like one week on and then one week you're off. I had booked, just by chance... Um, what the hell's that club? Uh, not Winnipeg, uh, Calgary. I booked a Calgary comedy cave on the off week. So I did the full week, had a car to drive around, had a place to stay, then went to Calgary for a week and then came back for like the semifinals and again, had a free car and a free place to stay. So that was like the only, I was like, I can't believe how lucky I am. These other people were like sleeping in trash bins and like bumming rides and stuff. I was like, this is like insanity. This is like a crazy, and I'm not trying to shit on the festival. No, I had a great time, but I'm like, if you don't have a free place to stay and a free car, this festival will put you in the hole, like seven grand. I never wow. saw the upside of it. They would always try to pitch it to me. And I'm like, this sounds terrible driving this far. Cause I was just doing spots in Seattle and I love doing that. I love just popping into town, doing a set at night. I don't love the bootstrap. Some some comics just love stand-up so much, they'll go anywhere. They'll do any gig. Um, I was never like that. I didn't want to... Like, I, I wouldn't want to go to some, like, two-bit town or whatever. Not to shit on two-bit towns, but if it's, like, some steel mill town or something. <laughs> and, and, like, they won't like my comedy. And, like, the type of comedy I'll have to do to, to do well will be, like, a different brand. I kind of like a cross-section semi-savvy crowd or just like a metropolitan area it's like a city um yeah but they just went so far around washington and the, the money was not great unless you won then it was like oh maybe you break even yeah so i ended up i did well i came in the top 10 i didn't make the top five so i got a thousand but i think place six through ten got a thousand dollars i think and so for me, which, you know, at that point in my career, I was like, oh, my God. I mean, when you do the math, you're like $1,000 for a month is pretty <laughs> shitty money. Yeah, driving <laughs> um, and lodging, food. Yeah, it's like actually it's below the poverty level for sure. But um, but at the time, it was exciting. Um, but, yeah, there is definitely some towns there that you're like, this is – we're in it now. I mean, this is like we're out in the middle of nowhere. Would you notice that uh, some people, maybe even yourself, like you would crush in one city and then finish last in another city? Just certain styles behooved different cities? Yeah, definitely. And it was judged weird, too. They would have these judges. And one guy, I think he is famous for this. I don't know his name. I wouldn't want to say his name, but I don't know it anyways. But he had like a record company. And I think he was a drunk 
or something, but he kept sleeping. Like he would be asleep. And I've heard of him at multiple comedy festivals asleep as a judge. <laughs> and we would laugh. We're like, he's asleep. And then he would just fill out his paper afterwards, um, which that was hilarious. And then one night, I like ripped. I just had one of those sets where you're just like, fuck everybody, blow. I'm the best comic in the world. Like, it was like, bring the pain. I mean, I threw the mic yeah. down. I wore leather pants. It was insane. <laughs> and. I came in like third and I couldn't believe it. And then afterwards, the guy that ran the thing told me I did a joke about drinking and driving or something about drinking and driving. And one of the judges, I don't know if his mother or sister or aunt or he knew oh, somebody no. that had been killed in a drunk driving. So I got zero. Like he just gave me Oof. zeros and it brought my thing down. And I was like, well, what is this? Like, that's insane. You know, uh, so there was a lot of like moments like that. And that's the essence of having art be judged. You know, it's like this is a little... You know, a, a competition of comedy is pretty silly, ultimately. But at the time, I I needed to do it. Yeah. Did you ever do Last Comic or anything like that? I did. I did well on... Um, I was on, I think, the last season. I think it was season seven or something like that. 2015. I think it was... I think it's the last one they've done. And it was the one that Clayton English won. And oh, okay. I'm... I made it to the finals. I lost to him. We did a head-to-head. -head. It was the one when Norm MacDonald was a judge and oh, Keenan cool. Ivory Waynes and Roseanne. And I did really well on it. I, I finished. I was a finalist. And one of the many times in my career that I was like, I'm going to be a celebrity. This is like crazy. <laughs> and they got rid of the house aspect. And they got rid of all like the I challenge you aspect and just made it straight stand-up which America wasn't interested in. And they moved it from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. So nobody watched it and nobody cared. Um, but I made decent money, but yeah, that was, that was, th I think that was the last competition I've, I've done. Hmm. How did that do afterwards? Um, like you mentioned, you know, you had your late night sessions and then doors kind of opened from there. What about last comic standing? Did, were you put on, um, the radar for a new demographic? Um, or did you just continue as is afterwards? Um, I feel like it's so weird now with like, I don't know, Fahim, how you feel, but I'm like, I feel like there's nothing, there's no, I've had no moments in my career. It feels like that have like blown it open where it's like now it's, and I keep having these things like last comic Letterman, Rogan, Netflix. I've had so many things where I'm like, here we go. <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> and it keeps being just little, just steadily up and I, I'm, I'm doing well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I last comic standing, like I added some good, you know, social media followers and I still get people that come and go, we've been following you since last comic standing, oh, but wow. I've never had a moment where I was really selling tickets. I mean, now my most recent special did well on YouTube and I haven't worked since because of pandemic. <laughs> so we'll see. But I, I, I do not have a, a moment where it's like, wow. Here we go now. Um, there hasn't been a real breakthrough. Just like I said, just little steady things. And I, I've had funny moments with it. I was talking to a guy, a comic, this is like a year ago or something, and he was like, once you do Rogan, I think then there's no turning back. You got you to gotta get on Rogan because then, then it's just like off to the races. And I was like, yeah, no, I, uh, I did it a few months ago. And he's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> he's like, you did? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, uh, shit, I, I missed it. And I was like, yeah, I think a lot of people did. <laughs> I've had several instances of that as well where they're like, oh, man, once you get on Rogan, I'm like, oh, I've, I've done Rogan. You know, or you'll be talking to people and they just have no idea or their mind is blown that you've done Rogan. Because no one catches all of them. You know, even if you listen to a lot of them, there's going to be some that slip through. So I've yeah. talked to several people who who claim to be adamant rogan fans and all that and i'm like oh yeah i've been on there and they just have no <laughs> recollect like they, they right. missed that episode obviously i have the best story like that and it involves the seattle competition uh i changed comedy into competition i said it weird but the seattle comedy competition i was there and this guy uh his name is um god i'm, I'm blanking on his name and we're like close I'll think of it in a second. Dave McDonough. Jesus, that's going to be embarrassing if he hears it. We're like good friends, but I haven't seen him in a long time. But anyways, I don't even think he does stand-up anymore, but Dave McDonough is a comic, and he did Seattle with me, and he got like eliminated from the competition, and there was this other comic. I think he was a Seattle comic, and he was like, 
the festival you got to do, the competition you got to do is Boston. You got to go do the Boston competition because that one's a, it's more of a comedy city and it's a little more populated. That one gets a little more industry. And Dave just waits a beat and he goes, yeah, I, uh, I won that last year. <laughs> <laughs> he, he literally was like the defending champion of the festival. And this guy just had to be like, ah, all right, well, and I don't know what to, I don't know what to tell you, <laughs> and it's it was just so funny because it was like oh so everything you just said is bullshit. you're just kind of talking out your ass like you were like if you get to do that competition then you're a household name and he's like no I won nobody gives a shit yeah I think those days are over it's very rare I mean maybe like t- like those moments exist but they're so rare like maybe Tiffany Haddish and Girls Trip but it's very rare that someone does one thing and then it's on. Those days are almost over. Back in the day for us comics, it was doing Johnny or things like that. But I'm like you where it's just been a couple things over the years. Like it'll be an acting thing, a few acting jobs, uh, a few late nights. You do Marin, you do Rogan, and you just keep on, you have a special and you just keep on working throughout the years. And all that adds up to the collective I guess, consciousness of you as a performer. And then you blink and you're kind of at this level. Obviously, you, you, you li- it's like looking at yourself in the mirror every day. You don't notice a, a difference. But if you checked from 10 years ago to now or even five years ago, you're obviously further along. But, but it is just these uh, million paper cuts that add up to something. Yeah, exactly. And, and you have those moments where people are like, Where'd this guy come from? I'll get like comments like that. I'm like, wow, this guy burst on the scene. I'm like, I've been doing comedy for 20. I'm on like the back half of, of shit. Um, yeah. Or people are like, this guy, he's, he's up and coming. And I'm like, well, I've been here a long time. <laughs> I, I know. know. <laughs> you know how long you have to do stand up to be considered a young up and comer? It's crazy. Yeah, it's really uh, weird. I remember hearing that about like Hootie and the Blowfish. I remember like seeing interviews with them. Like they kind of had that thing of like these guys came from nowhere and they're like, we've been playing in wherever they're from. I don't know, South Carolina or something. They're like, we've been together for 15 years or whatever it was. Um, yeah, I just like to sh- shoehorn in Hootie and the Blowfish in any <laughs> bu- <laughs> bu- bu- I guess I do. They meant a lot to you. They're sort of I, your compass. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that stuck with me, but I do remember them saying, like, I, I just seeing multiple interviews of them saying that, and I remember thinking, like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like it takes years to be an overnight sensation. Right. Uh, but I, I found, like, the most beneficial thing to me is being partnered with Mark Norman in a podcast. Like, he's he's blowing up. I'm just picking up his scraps. They're like, hey, heard about you from Norman. And that's, like, his Rogan appearance has gotten me more... Uh, fans than my own Rogan appearance. Uh, so that's what I recommend is send some friends out to go and, and do your bidding. Yeah, I, I got to get my Norman, dude. Ollie, <laughs> can you be my Norman? Get out there. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. I'm going to go fake some pranks and blow up on TikTok and then come back. <laughs> no, I don't want that audience. Just like fake YouTube shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like, I feel like w- w- with with comedy, like what is it or your benchmark because for everyone it's different you know what's a benchmark where you're like okay now i'm like on the scene like the quote-unquote scene you know like everyone keeps saying you're up and coming when for you specifically are you like okay i've made it type you know so you don't get those like i'm up and coming title does that make sense yeah i I don't know with the up and coming i guess it's just like anyone that has never heard of you and then hears of you yeah. thinks like oh he must be They'll always coming up yeah yeah but for me that's what late night represented something for me is that that's a, it reminds me of rudy i don't know if you guys are familiar with the movie i mean oh, obviously yeah. you're familiar with it but i don't know how familiar <laughs> you are with it i love it um but there's a scene in in rudy where they're like he's talking to his brother and they're playing shuffleboard and he's like it's pretty simple we turn on the games and we don't see you and rudy's like no no i'm on the team and they're like well why don't we see you come out of the tunnel that's what late night felt like for me is like there's now something I can point to and be like, look, yeah. here I am. I'm on the fucking NBC or whatever. Instead of just being like, no, no, I did the VFW. I mean, I killed. I, they gave me free spaghetti and meatballs and a hundred bucks. <laughs> it was awesome. I'm a comedian. That to me, for me at least felt like here I am. I've done TV. I'm on, I've done something on TV. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you do more of those things. I guess it's just getting uh, those credits that separate you from 
the pool of comedians where any random person can say I do stand up like a homeless person could say I do stand up today you know and without any credits you both are right yeah. you know right. but the, but and the only legitimizers are these like a late night okay so now that's a tear up and then doing a special okay that's a tear up and then act guest starring in a thing or so all these things just sort of separate you you become mm -hmm. a more r rare company like doing Rogan yeah. or yeah Oh, yeah, it, it definitely, it, it makes it feel, I, I always, I have this theory that if people th hear that you do comedy and they don't know who you are, they assume you suck. <laughs> That's how I feel. Not like only that, you're like, but uh, also think you're crazy. I've always <laughs> felt that. Early on in my comedy career, I was kind of embarrassed. Uh, I would keep that very close to myself. I wouldn't tell people that I do comedy, like coworkers or, or even like people I went to college with. Cause I just felt like there was judgment. If you, if you do a particular art and you're not famous, I think there's a large faction of people who just think you're, you're like a lunatic or you're, you're crazy. <laughs> I completely agree. I do the same thing. I always say, um, I was, t I'm going to name drop. I was telling this to Brian Regan and he was dying laughing, but I was like, whenever I'm on the road, I tell the cab driver, my friend just had a baby and it's always worked. And I'm like, yeah, my, I'm visiting my friend. He had a baby. So I flew in town. And then Regan just immediately laughed. He's like, you know, he does Brian Regan voice. He's like, yeah, you do a lot of baby visiting? <laughs> he's like, and he's like, I had to visit a baby in Kansas City. And then I visited a baby in St. Louis last week. <laughs> he's like, and he just goes on like this four minute Brian Regan bit. And I'm like, I guess it is like put to any questioning. It does sound silly. The idea of like my friend in Louisiana had a baby. So I'm down here visiting it. But anyways, my point is, yeah, I never want to admit that I'm a, a stand-up. And uh, Regan, I'm just going to tell his story. His his thing was him and his brother, who's a comic, always say they're painters. Like, that's their fake job. So even, like, a high level, you don't want to admit you're a comic. And then um, he said one time he golfed, him and his brother golfed, and they set him up with, like, a, another pair. And they kept asking him all these painting questions. And he's like, oh, no. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> they're like, what kind of paint do you use for, a, what do you paint, houses? And they're like... They had no concept of anything painting. And he's like, we really did not think this through. Like, just imagine golfing for four hours with someone who's just asking you painting questions. And eventually you just have to be like, I'm a comedian. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, that guy's really funny. I love Regan. I, I always say yeah, no, I, I've had when they ask I've me. had to. Still? Like, till this day, do you still... Is Ali frozen for you, Joe? I, I think Ali, yeah, I think you froze. Am I back? Ali, come back to us. All right, you're unfrozen. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, yeah, back. Yeah, I'm maybe. swaying. I'm swaying so you guys can get the motion. I was saying, like, still till this day, <laughs> do you still use the engineer line? Oh, yeah, because if I say I'm a comic or, like, a writer or actor or anything like that, it's just they talk your ear off. It, uh, I mean... I get it. You know, it's interesting. It's not every day that they have a stand-up comedian in the backseat, so they just, like, ask a bunch of questions. But engineering is... Sometimes you get home from the airport or you you come from LAX, you just want to go home and be on your yeah. phone and decompress. But if you say stand-up, you're going to be you're gonna be chatting. It's going to be a long car ride. Yeah. Yeah, but if you say engineer, they just, they kind of be quiet. Although one time I was in a cab in, or, like, an Uber, and the guy was... He was a mechanical engineering major, and he was asking me all these questions, and he gave me his oh, business man. card to like help out. And <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, <sighs> you're gonna get one of those. Yeah, yeah. I used to, uh, I used to do that for healthcare consulting. I had this whole script, like, am I, I knew who my clients were, what city I work in, because like you don't want to say like I'm a filmmaker. Then again, yeah, that opens this door of like questions and like oh are you like how much how much do you make and you're just like i don't even want to talk about this i'm just like once you tell someone a boring career no one, there's rarely any follow-ups yeah exactly comedy people want to hear bits too they're like ah you're not very fun they have the same <laughs> fucking lines that are just infuriating and you're like ah i don't know uh, sorry I, I just always end up apologizing i'm like ah, i don't know so and then i try <laughs> to be funny in some way i'll just start swearing yeah. like i'm inside a cab being like ah shit's crazy out there man it's fucked and they're like, what? You, you just do crowd work when they go, tell me a joke. He's like, ah, anybody celebrating anything today? Uh, shit, <laughs> shit's crazy out there, huh? Trump, huh? Uh, um, that could be a sketch that's really funny. Yeah, just crowd work in the back of a cab. Yeah, we, we were talking about that the other week, how for comedians, when you tell someone you're a comedian, there, there's always this expectation of like, to another dimension oh, tell again? me a joke. Hold on. 
Oh Lord, am I? Hold on, we got. Let me know when 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 I get back. Expectation of tell me a joke. You're back. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that thought of like for comedians when you say oh to someone new that you just met like I'm a comedian. How do you deal with the oh tell me a joke if you're a comedian because they expect like these one liners these little one zinger punchline jokes. How do you navigate that conversation? You know, it's it's so funny that as you're saying, I'm like, uh, I'm very into mindfulness and I'm like mindful of like my body is like tensing up just thinking about it because I'm like putting myself, <laughs> nothing makes yeah. me less comfortable than when like a cab driver, somebody's like, ah, but tell me a joke, yeah, make me laugh. You don't seem very funny. And I'm just like, <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> and uh, now it's like, I, uh, that's what's nice about having stuff on YouTube at least. You like check out my special, it's on YouTube. Uh, or you can say like, I, I've been on the Tonight Show. To me, it's like, I'd rather give them resume than a joke. Yeah. To just be like, I swear to God, I'm a real comedian. I, I'm not being funny right now. I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Ah. And then they usually want, they don't even want to hear a joke. They just want to show that they're funny. And oh. so it ends up just kind of being like a thing where you're like, ha ah, man, yep. Yeah, dude. You like, got that's it. What end, <laughs> that's what I end up doing. I don't know. Do you have a joke ready, Fahim, when someone asks you? No, I'm bad at that. Like, uh, and I have, I don't have that people pleaser thing at all. If if they say tell me a joke, I'm just like, I'm, I say I'm off the clock, like in a in a funny way or whatever. I'm like, ah, I'm off the clock, or it doesn't work that <laughs> way. I don't try to like think of one. It's just too hard, you know. And, and even if I do think of one, it's gonna flop. It's not going to do well. It's not a comedy <laughs> club. We're on the freeway. <laughs> That's a really funny idea if you do a joke and the guy's just like howling. He's like, come on, stop it, man. He's like driving up the road, dying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, the best really you're going to get. It. Yeah. The best you're ever going to get is like, oh, man, that's, that's something. And the, uh, like I said, normally they want to say, my uncle's really funny. You should try this on stage or something. They want to give you something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would get that a lot, too. And the, the people who live vicariously where they have the comic itch, but you know, they're in too deep in regular civilian life. So you're a conduit to try these jokes out. Like in their mind, they're going to be your, your Bob Zamuda, you know, (laughs) 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 they're like, why don't you try this? And okay. It's your loss. It's a great joke. Yeah, exactly. Bill Maher wrote about that in his, do you ever read true story? His book? Uh Uh-uh. Oh, it's great. He, so Bill Maher wrote like, it's like a novel. It's just a, it's a, it's a novel called True Story about being a comedian in comics. And um, I think it's based on real people, obviously. Um, but it's good. I mean, it's probably out of print. I don't know if you can find it. But I'm going to give away the ending of the book. But like, the book kind of ends. He does like a private gig at somebody's house. And they kick him out after the show. They're kind of like, okay, take care. That was great. See you later. And he's kind of like, oh, I thought I was going to like hang. I killed. There's some beautiful women here. And like, he has this realization walking away like, oh, they want to be the funny one now. Nobody wants a comedian at their party. They want to tell stories. They're like, I'm, you leave, so now I can tell my stories. I don't want you fucking taking over my party. Um, he obviously writes it more eloquently yeah. and unlikably, but, um, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a great point that he kind of made of like, everyone else wants, they don't want a comedian around. They want to go see a comedian and then leave and, and be like, I'm funnier than him. Check this out. That's true. Have you done, that reminds me though, like, have you done, I love horror stories when it comes to like a private gig or a corporate gig or, you know, one of these millionaires want you to do their, their mansion backyard and it's just like God awful. Cause you, I, 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 you do so much stand up. I imagine you've got to have like some war stories. I've done some, I'm trying to like think of some good ones. I, I always think of these gigs like after I've left, I, after the show's over, I'm like, oh shit, I should have told him about that. But I mean, the f- the funniest one I did was, this is like years ago, and I was new. I had no chops whatsoever. I was like maybe four or five years in, and it was a gig at like, th- it was like 3.30 in the morning. I thought it was like an after prom type of thing. It was like, it wasn't maybe it wasn't 3.30, but it was late. It was like 11.30 p.m. or midnight, and I was like, the guy was like, it's a weird gig. It's this group, and I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't even ask questions at the time. You just jump on any gig, and I had to meet him like in a parking lot, and then a golf cart came and picked us up. This guy picked us up in a golf cart and he had like a flashlight as the headlight. And he drove us like through the woods, literally like in the middle of the night, through the woods. And there was this huge group of people, like a couple hundred people. And it turned out it was like all these like recovering alcoholics and addicts. And at the time I was 22 and I, 
I'm sober now, but I still drank. And I didn't have any of these details for some reason. And they're like, yeah, it's these recovering addicts. Don't talk about alcohol or anything. And all my jokes were about being oh, a 22-year-old drunk guy. And they're like, you're up after this musician. And it was a singer, and he sang this song called Lord, Turn This Wine Back Into Water. <laughs> And it was like this ballad and literally like everybody was sobbing. Like everyone was like holding hands and like, you said it all, man. And then like they brought me up and I just ate shit. And I, I was trying to dance around all these drinking and driving jokes that I couldn't do. And literally people were like crying and out in the woods, like finding God. And I was just like, ah, fuck. Hey guys, <laughs> like who yeah. likes sex? And so that was one that like comes to mind of just like, I I'm fucked. I have no chance out here. And then afterwards, you have to get back on the golf cart, that like sad drive back to your car. Just <laughs> exactly. Flashlight. exactly. And I, I just ate, I just ate it. And uh, I'm just sitting on the golf cart like, yeah, woo, that was crazy. <laughs> um, and then I went and, you know, drank my face off. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to ask you too about your experience between, you know, you're a New York comic, but I would see you at the comedy store every now and then, like when you're in town to do a Conan or, or to do, um, uh, you've, I, I've, you know, I saw you at the comedy store a few times, just in the hallways and stuff. So you've done both. What are your? Because there is this whole ancient argument between New York and LA comedy. What What are your thoughts on that and your feelings and experiences from doing both? Um, well, first of all, like I love Los Angeles as a city. Like I never understood. I, it's funny. My wife and I were laughing about it last night because I always just think it's like there's these New York comics that I think it's like cool to say like fuck L.A. man, L.A. sucks or whatever. And as a city, I'm like, what is it you hate? Like the the perfect weather, the mountains, the ocean, like the hiking. I I just I really, but I love most cities. Honestly, I'm just. Anyways, I, I, I love L.A. as a city, and like I have a lot of like great friends there. Um, so I like being there. I like the comedy store. I like the history of it. I like the rooms. I, it's just a cool place. But I haven't done like high-level comedy store. I've done the, um, the belly room a couple times, which I love. I've had fun there. And then I've, I've done whatever the Monday friends and family is or whatever. Like I've done the first spot when it, the lights kind of go out, and it becomes like a regular show. Cool. So you've um, done the OR then? Yeah. The, the original room. Yeah, that's, yeah. So that's, that's the quintessential comedy store room. That's my favorite. That's like the heart and soul of the comedy store. The main room's yeah. great. You know, Louis did a special there. Uh, you know, Pryor did it live at the Sunset Strip. And then the belly room, you you did it there. Chappelle did his, one of his specials up there. Yeah. Um, but the heart and soul is the OR. So that's cool that you've experienced it. Yeah. So I've done it a couple of times, but like, both times it was like real early in the night and it was kind of had just kind of turned over and it was it was like fine or f one of them was fun one wasn't great like one night maybe I ate it but um, as far as like the the cellar is like my home it just feels like I just feel like more comfortable there than anywhere else like including my parents' house or whatever like it just I just yeah. feel like it feels there's a warmth and also like the crowds are just like hot there. Like LA, I haven't experienced LA. Maybe it, it's never like this. Or maybe it is sometimes like I haven't had a show in LA that I'm like, it's like, holy shit. I just ripped it up, man. I've had some good sets of the improv. Uh, and I did the laugh factory once and it was pretty bad, but the cellar with that like low ceiling, it's usually packed. They're hot. And you can just, you can like rip at the cellar. So, um, I definitely prefer it. It's also like, my home and like i said maybe i just haven't experienced the the store if it gets like that um but yeah. uh yeah i i love i love being in la and i love doing those la shows when i am there yeah like um i you've done la a bit i've done new york just i, I think you've done la more than i've done new york i've done it a little bit like when we were filming goat face out in new york we were running some sets around town just for the stand-up portion of it and then maybe one or two other times I was out there. Maybe collectively I've done six sets in New York or something. Uh, but I wish I've done more. I wish I had more under my belt. But what I found just initially, just my initial thoughts on New York versus LA is what I liked about New York was the cross section of the crowd. Every, it felt like everyone was from a different sector of, of commerce, you know, whether you have some fashion people, you have some finance people, you have, just at really well-rounded crowds. Whereas in, in LA, sometimes it could be so industry. Like you're just playing to musicians and actors 
or everyone's right. trying to like everyone in the crowd or 80% of the people in the crowd are trying to make it in some way. You will get right. some tourists, but less people who are just like happy in their profession, y you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I feel that way too. And somehow New York, uh, feels like I understand there's like tourists in LA obviously, but like it, it feels the shows I've done are like grittier. It, like you said, it feels like there's like, tough like la people and tattoos and music and like bikers new york feels like a lot of like hey, we came to new york it's it's exciting here woo <laughs> like yeah. I, I don't know like la has a much seedier uh, people might debate this but like la feels or, or at least the, the comedy store feels like seedier than um the the cellar like the cellar feels like mcdougal street and it's like this like where like the folk scene started and the comedy store feels like this is where rock and roll happens. People like overdose outside here. I, yeah. I don't know. That's like, I don't know if that is too broad or whatever. That's how I feel. But I, I also like I'm intimidated by LA. Mm. Well, I know what you mean too. Just you're intimidated by spaces you're not used to. Cause you know how you say the cellar is, is like more home than home for you. That's a foreign place to me. I've been there maybe once or twice. I went there with Hassan one time. You know, he was running, he was gearing up for his special or something. So I was just tagging along. And, and I see comics I know, but it's this foreign entity. And obviously, I want to be a part of its history eventually. But I, I've always been meaning to crack that nut once I'm in New York for an extended period of time. Like if I'm there for a week or two, it doesn't. I just don't see the value of me trying to get past there if I'm never in New York. So it always holds this, like this mystique. Yeah, I think that's the exact experience for me with the store. And I've had, I think it's Adam, right? He's the guy that books the thing. Yeah, he's been really nice to me, and and um, I'm close with a lot of the guys that he is. So, but I'll always do a set there, and he'll be like, I, I cannot pass anybody right now. I got two, and I'm like, No, no, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want it, I don't want my name on the thing. I'm just passing <laughs> through. I'm happy to do five minutes just to say I was here, like. Because I know everyone, obviously people are like, I got to get in here or get past there. I'm like, I always try to be like, I, I don't want anything. I don't want, I don't, I don't not want to work here, but I'm like, I'm sure. not interested in anything for you. I don't but need honestly, anything. That's, that's the best angle ever though, because 90% of the people are the opposite of that. Right. 90% of people are ha like hounding him, cornering him in the hallway and being like, Hey, look at my set. And how come I'm not passed? And he has to judo so many people in that building. So for you to be like, hey, I'm just running my set for Conan and whatever, like, yep, yeah, by all means, whatever. I'm just happy for the time that I do get. That's yeah, like well, refreshing as fuck. That's the that's the best part of having some success in any business, but I think particularly show business is that you're like, I don't need anything. There's a lot of things I would like, but I do. I definitely do not need. When you're start, if you start in LA, you're like, I need to get past at the store. I need some place I can get up. But you're like, I, I don't need anything from any of you. I, anything I get in L.A. is a bonus. That would be delightful. Yeah, that whole I don't need anything is so powerful um, in, in many regards. Like even in stand up, like that was a lesson that I learned after a few years. Just years out there running some jokes, doing, exchanging these ideas. Once the crowd knows that you don't need anything from them, it's so much fun. Right, because right. you could you could tell like a first year comic or someone who's just doing it like they they need that from the crowd, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> and it's and it doesn't really bode well for the success of the set, and even professionally <laughs> like you're talking about like, look, I would love to, but I don't need anything. It's crazy how far you go when you don't need anything. You can want things, but to physically need it so much is off putting in in so many different areas. Yeah, and it, it's it's painful, and yeah, people are like, "Jesus, this guy, <laughs> what's up with this guy?" So it, it's nice to just kind of be like, "Hey, thanks, thanks for the time. See you later." That's another thing I have that's weird with LA is like I have so many like really close friends that I've known for years. So a lot of times I don't even want to do anything. I just want to meet up and go. Like Henry Phillips is a really good friend of mine. Oh, I Andy love Henry Hendrickson. Phillips. Yeah, yeah, I mean he's like the best, and and Chris Walsh and Andy Hendrickson and Tommy Johnigan are like like really really close friends so half the time i'm like let's just go get dinner i don't want to hang out and schmooze i want to go see these people that that i love you know so that's it, it's probably almost bad for me with la like some people are like i'm i've got three generals i'm pitching the show <laughs> and i'm like i'm having lunch with andy hendrickson and then i'm having a cigar with tommy john again people are like oh boo yeah you go my schedule's pretty slammed i've got cigars with john again i've got uh, spaghetti with <laughs> chris Walsh. <laughs> But anyways, so that's my L.A. feelings. Ollie hit him. 
uh, what's the? I mean, right now, because for him, you're you're touring the country. You're doing not touring, but like you're doing some shows in Arizona. Have you kind of left New York to do shows outside? Because you said you guys took a trip, but but yeah. So it, has there been oh, shows geez. available for you to do? That's like not in New York. Like, have you gone to Arizona or Texas or some of these spaces in the over the last what? How long has it been? Eight nine months to do stand up? Yeah, I think. God, I think it's like ten months now. It's so yeah, fucking long, I or maybe it's nine. Oh man! Uh, but no, track. I haven't really. Um, I did. Uh, there's a gig in Royersford, which is uh, hard to say. Royersford, Pennsylvania. That uh, there's this guy that has a club there. And the club obviously has been closed, so they just started doing shows in the parking lot. And it's like an amazing gig. It's like in the summer, he turned it all into sand, so it was like a beach. And now they have a heated oh, tent. Wow. So I've done that three times. I'm going to go do it a fourth time in a few weeks. Um, but that's pretty much the furthest or farthest I've gone. I, I did some gigs in Boston in the summer. Um, so I've done a few dates, but nothing, just Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Jersey, um i haven't done much i've done traveling but i've actually went to seattle for a week um uh, but just to see the friend i was talking about earlier um yeah. but yeah i'm sort of just kind of cool hanging out <laughs> you know just kind of <laughs> yeah. taking the time off I, I i'm kind of enjoying it um obviously there's a lot i miss and it there's a lot of you know i'd like to be making the money but um, for now, a, lo- a lot of the gigs were like, you can do it, but it's 25% capacity. So it's like, you know, a fraction of the money. And I'm just like, ah, I don't want to risk it for that. I'll just wait. So that's what I've been doing. I'm curious with this slowdown and, um, you know, work being more sporadic, the road work and everything. How has that affected your writing process? Do you find yourself kind of throttling back? What, well, yeah, what has that done to your comedy brain? I have not written anything in a long time. <laughs> I'm like, I, I've been writing a little bit here and there. If I think of something, I'll kind of write. And then there's definitely part of me that's like, oh, God, what if I suck now? But I did enough shows in the summer that I was like, all right, I got some stuff. I got a few new things. And I, I'm also lucky because I shot this special that I shot in March right before we shut down. But I had waited a long time to do something. So I had like, 40 extra minutes i had like i was kind of had like an hour and 40 minutes of material and i shot like 55 of it so i had like 40 minutes of pretty established material that isn't hasn't been anywhere Mm. so i kind of just have to remember those bits which doesn't take too much time you can kind of listen to the recordings from january and be like okay i have an act that i can go out with and then i can build off of it when it's when it's time and i wrote a few new things so here and there like if i have a thought i'll write a little bit i wrote today but it's like I was saying earlier, it's it's hard to write if you don't know when you're going to do it. Yeah, I found that too. Like I'll still come up with ideas every now and then, but I, not at the pace. There's something about ha- – it's like milking a cow. If you don't have the bucket, uh, <laughs> it's just you're not getting any milk really. Like I, I, I find that I can write so much faster if I have a show later tonight to actually try it because then you're in this homeostasis of, of, of ideas being thought of you just think of more when you have an outlet. Exactly. And I was saying similarly, I'm like, one of the reasons I feel like I'm prolific is because not because I'm like, I got to get a new hour to the people. I write jokes because I'm like, I I can't tell these jokes again. I fuck, I've done 14 sets in the last, you know, 10 nights. I just, I have to come up with something to say. And so without doing the sets, I don't have the urgency to come up with stuff because I'm just like, I'm not telling jokes every night. Where before it's like, let me write a joke because I I need something to do tonight that's different than the three shows I did last night. Uh, yeah, I need it to to polish the gem. I just have a bunch of rocks and like, what do I do with these rocks? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I need those sets to kind of grind the edges and all that and, and make it sparkly. And when you don't have that, it's I just have a bucket of rock tonight. Like, what good is that? Like, they'll be great maybe once the floodgates open and I I am able to get on stage enough to kind of polish things. But right now it's just wait. Yeah, exactly. I mean that was that was beautifully said, man. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm like, I've is a, that? I've, a- had a, I've had a lot of time to prepare <laughs> that analogy because I'm not doing stand up. I'm just coming up with analogies now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is that a bit? That's good, man. <laughs> I was like, that could be something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't been writing 
too much. But but I've done a couple, you know, st- videos and a couple sketches that I have in my head that I'm like, ah, oh, maybe I'll do that. Just try to find other outlets. Yeah. Oh, what, what, I want to talk to you about this too. What's interesting is you're a fan. We've talked about it on the pod before. Like I'll I'll do the dance videos every now and then. And you're always like a a big champion of them, which is so surprising to me. (laughs) That's what I found about um, the weird thing about dancing just by posting the videos every now and then is certain people really resonate. It resonates with them. And I I have no idea until I see the comments or the texts or the like. And like, I would never think that you are into (laughs) dance, you know? Well, you know, it's funny because I love dancing. I've never had any formal dance training, but I'm like a, I'm a music guy. I'm a rock and roll guy and a, a spiritual fella, I guess. And I've always been a music guy. So I had that at my wedding. Like I, I, I mean, I can dance pretty well. Like for a guy that, not at, <laughs> I, don't, I can't dance as well as you, but I mean, I, I can dance. I, I understand rhythm and yeah. music, and I can dance. So. My wedding, like, I was just, like, off my ass, and everyone was like, what? (laughs) Like, what is this? And I'm like, yeah, I like dancing. And then the DJ at my wedding said, he's like, I've never seen a bride and groom dance this much. This is really strange. Like, we, (laughs) my wife and I did not socialize at any moment in our wedding. We just danced 100% of the thing. So I love it. And so when I see someone that can dance, I'm like, holy shit. Like, you can, like, you're, like, really dancing. Um I love it. I don't know. Like, I don't know if it makes me, you know, uh, what it makes me, but I'm like, I, I love a good dance. I like watching someone that can dance. It's, it's fun to me. It's flattering. And I don't know what it makes you either, but it's just fun to be on this side of it. Just sort of as a lightning rod for, for the people on Instagram who like dance. Like you're a guy who sticks out. And then also Jay Larson loves it. <laughs> you know, you would never think Jay Larson is into dance. So it's weird. You get to find out who's a vampire. Interesting. We're both Boston guys. Maybe there's something about Boston. Do you think um, it's some sort of repression or something? <laughs> like just a celebration of life that you're not allowed to have growing up or something? I don't know. I mean, like, I, I love foot. I like singing in the rain is like one of my favorite movies. And like, I'll show people uh, like the all the all the music numbers, and I'm like, look at this. Sh-. I'm like, I watch Gene Kelly, and I'm like, this guy's fucking unbelievable. <laughs> like, it's like blowing my mind. Um, so. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is. Yeah, maybe it is some kind of uh, repressed thing or something. But I also, I'm just drawn to all the arts. Like I, I love movie. I love dance. I love music. I love uh, photography. I'm just uh, a fan of anyone doing something. Yeah, artistic, I, I guess. I think as we get older too, we get further away from dance as well. Like I, just as someone who used to dance as a kid there would always be school dances or there would always be these opportunities for you to kind of utilize the skill. And it was just there. But as you get a job, life just kind of drills that out of you, or there's really no instance for that to ever come up again. Like after high school, I don't think I ever really danced publicly or there's no space for it. Like I do it for fun in my room or at my house um, since but when I was working at Boeing and once you have like a real job, you're really not dancing anymore. Like, like once you turn uh, 19 or, or once you're out of your youth, you don't really dance as much as you used to when you were younger. No, it's a great point. And it is like spiritual to me in that it is like, um, it's so celebratory. Like I, I was at my wedding, going back to my wedding, like we, our song was um, you're the one that I want from Greece. And like, we we're like, we don't want to slow dance. That's, sucks like i don't want to make people watch a slow dance that's like silly so we came out and the dj was like they want everyone to come out you know sarah and joe want everyone to come out so like everybody flooded on the dance floor and i started like sobbing because it's you know laughter and dance are similar in that they're like they're pure joy nobody's dancing while they're sad um so to see like everyone i've ever loved um you know, dancing to a, a silly song was like, it's so moving. And it's also fascinating that there's people that are unable to dance. And again, I don't want to make it seem like I'm fucking Michael Jackson here, <laughs> but it's just weird when you see people that are like, they, 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 don't, they don't know how to move rhythmically at all. You know what I mean? Like, again, yeah, like yeah. anyone that knows how to dance would not look at me and be like, oh, this guy's a dancer. But like, I understand how to move my body to a beat and a rhythm. Um, yeah. you know what I mean? And so it's fascinating that people that, that can't is really interesting to me. And you, you are also in the same camp as me kind of where ma- your dancing ability doesn't match up with how you look. And that blows people's minds. It's almost <laughs> insulting 
when they're surprised at how well you can dance. You know what I mean? It's like when someone says, like, oh, you lost a lot of weight. Like, oh, you thought I was fat, like, the whole time? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so them be like, whoa, you can really dance. Like, yeah, just because I wear glasses or you don't think I have it in me? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've felt that way with a lot of things I've done. Like, I, I'm a really good athlete, and I remember, like, throwing football around in the park, and someone was like, whoa, you can throw a football. And it was, like, <laughs> insulting, or I was like, yeah, like, no, I'm like, a, I was, like, a really good athlete. Like, what? What? It's like it's like hurtful to me. I'm like, no, I know how to. I, I don't know. I guess people. I guess I have the. I, I put out a vibe of like uh, an idiot. I guess I think it's the glasses and teeth. People think I'm like a, a nerd. I guess I used to do a joke about this. I have this thing where people were like, oh, he's like a nerd, and I'm like, I'm actually like a really bad student. I hate sci-fi. I've never played chess. Like I, I got laid. Um, you know, I. I feel like <laughs> I'm like a, kind of a dummy. <laughs> like I'm like, I, no, no, I'm not. I'm not a nerd at all. I'm not even smart. Yeah, you're the opposite. But um, <laughs> like the the dancing thing too is like it's uh, people don't realize that. I think some people are so afraid to dance. I I was talk, talking to Ali. I go ninety percent of dancing is just sort of throwing yourself off the ledge or allowing yourself to like let go enough to dance. Some people don't even do that. Yeah, that, which again is like strangely sad i remember having that feeling with like my parents didn't dance at my wedding and i'm like can you just like kind of stand out here or something like my friend uh, this made me so emotional too my friend alvin he actually might be able to dance but we were like everyone was dancing he was just jumping up and down like it was like a 90s like <laughs> hip-hop thing and, and he was just bouncing to like whatever song came on he was just bouncing and again it's like an ex it's an expression of joy i mean if, if there's music and you're and you're moving that's yeah. dancing. So to me, yeah. like jumping up and down is is dancing. Like even if you can't dance or whatever, just the act of letting go or tr just losing yourself, even if it doesn't look right, allowing yourself to lose yourself is a win. If I look at someone and they're not the best dancer in the world, but they're like really letting go, that's beautiful, even still. Like it may yeah. not be Michael Jackson or whatever, but it's equally compelling. Yeah, no, I I agree. And it's... It's just, uh, it's fun. Like I said, it's the ultimate letting go of any um, inhibitions, which is a word I don't even know what that means, but I think I'm using it. I think no, it makes sense. you're using it. You're using it. Yeah, yeah. So, me, um, yeah, yeah, I love it. To me, it's the closest thing you can get to, like, flying. It just feels yeah, like yeah. flying, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fun. And, and, no, you, and you've been a big influence on my dancing. I, I, I dance yes. as, as similarly to you as I can. And in fact, somebody I think posted that because I, I was on TikTok for like a minute during pandemic. Yeah. And I posted some video of, of <laughs> dancing and someone was like, hey, this is Fahim's thing. And I was like, I'm not trying to do Fahim. <laughs> That's hilarious. I was just dancing. I don't know. Sorry. I'm trying to make it okay for more comedians to, to come out of the dance closet, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that. So yeah, maybe I'll do something else. No, it's okay. I don't own the market on that. Anyone could do it. It reminds me of um, Chris. You know, do you know Chris Walsh, the Walsh Brothers? Oh yeah, I love the Walsh Brothers. Yeah. So they used to, Chris Walsh used to do this character, the Naked Yeti, which I feel like you couldn't even <laughs> do now. But like he would do this big show in, in back in Boston, and he would just walk through like Bigfoot, just completely naked. <laughs> and then one time we were hanging out at my apartment. He wasn't there. It's was like my roommates, and I just walked out naked and picked up a glass like it was nonchalant. <laughs> And my friend was like, that's Chris Wall. You doing Chris Walsh now? And I was like, <laughs> well, I just thought it'd be funny to come out in the living room naked. I didn't, I wasn't, I'm not trying to do his act. I was just like being yeah. a goof and uh, Ste um, stealing bits for a living room. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I was sorry. <laughs> but it was, you still have that feeling of like, shit, am I a hack? I just thought it would be funny <laughs> to walk out. And anyways, there was, there was no women there. We were all close friends. Yeah, it's all good. I don't want to get canceled. You're, you're I don't want to get canceled for that story. <laughs> Holly, do you have a parting question? Uh, yeah, I mean, you brought up TikTok. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, because everything's been kind of dead, everyone's been repurposing a lot of their our online content, their stand up through social media. Have you been utilizing that? I mean, outside of like, because you mentioned you started a podcast um, during the quarantine and you have two other podcasts. Uh, have you been utilizing uh, TikTok or other platforms more to like kind of promote your comedy? I guess a little bit. TikTok, I tried to get into. My w my wife loves it, and she was doing well on there. And a, a few comics were like, hey, I'm posting old bits, and it's like blowing up. And so I was like, all right, I got to get on there. But I first of all, with TikTok, I hate that when you open it, it immediately is like playing. It's, something's like happening, and... 
I'm trying real hard to, that's another thing I've been doing during pandemic. We talked about it earlier. Like I've been trying to really pull back on social media and the phone addiction. And I read this book called how to break up with your phone. And I keep listening to all these podcasts and shit about the dangers of smartphones and all this stuff. So I'm like, I just can't have another thing. I, 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 mm-hmm. I hate it. It makes me like strange, like sick. So I tried for a minute to do TikTok. And someone was like, hey, you should just get somebody to post your stand-up videos on there. Um, so maybe I'll try to do that. Because yeah. like, I guess people are like, it brings people in. Like, you got to just do it. So maybe I'll try to do that. Um, but yeah, I guess I've been using... I've, I've been working on my YouTube the last like month or so to kind of try to get my subscribers up and put stuff on that. And w- one of the podcasts I'm doing, I'm just putting on YouTube. So that's been the thing. I'm like, that seems like... The way to go again, like Norman, who's my podcast partner, Mark Norman, like his YouTube is just blown up, and it's a TV channel. I'm like, he's making great money, so I'm like, that feels like the future. It was like you, the idea of YouTube and having subscribers on there and just putting whatever on there. Um, so that's like the main thing I'm trying to work on, and it feels somehow the least uh, addictive to me, but it's still yeah. addictive. <laughs> yeah, it feels more like movie releases rather than every minute I got to put something up. Like it, it doesn't feel, it feels more precious than because TikTok feels like a full-time job or Instagram feels like a full-time job, but releasing something on YouTube once a week, that seems more manageable and like you're not as plugged in. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to manage that. I would like to get to a point of financial success where I can hire somebody that's like this manages my social media. That feels like the ideal situation. You don't even have to look at it and someone's just putting stuff up, but I'm not. I'm not making that hire people money right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, man. Thanks so much for doing the pod. You have anything to like? Plug your socials, obviously. The special. I hate myself. Check that out on YouTube. So, wh- what are your socials? Yeah. So it's at Joe List Comedy on Twitter and Instagram, and then uh, I hate myself is the special, and my YouTube is. I think it's just Joe List. I started doing this um, podcast with my friend Ronan Hirschberg, who's a hilarious comedian, and we just talk movies and. Um, He's got like hardcore takes. He's becoming like the the uh, the villain on it, which is pretty fun. Um, so it, it's fun. It's just we're just talking movies and bullshitting. And then I have Tuesdays with Stories with Mark Norman, which is like a straight up comedy podcast. It's extremely irreverent. I feel like I have to warn people. And then I'm doing this other podcast called Mindful Metal Jacket, which is more of a mental health kind of. Uh, I talk with comics, uh, just kind of about their experiences with anxiety and stuff. And and it's it's fun. People seem to enjoy it. There you have it. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Huh. I mean, you, you're a guy I wanted to get for a while. Like, we haven't been doing guests that much, and once we got back into it, I was like, let's get Joe. Let's see if he'll do it. So I was stoked when you said yeah. No, man, I'm pumped. This is this is a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I hope I didn't talk too much. And, no, um, not at all, man. That's the whole point, man. We want to hear what you got to say. Oh, awesome. Thanks, man. No, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan, so I'm happy to do it. I appreciate it. No problem. And then I always we always like leave him with a song, so I got to tell you what the song is. I gotta bounce them out to this dope track, you know. They get one track a week. I spoil uh, the fans. <laughs> all right, this track, guys. Do you have Do you have a date you want to plug coming up at all? Like a road date? Um, I guess if you're anywhere near Royersford, um, <laughs> Pennsylvania. Uh, most of our J- fans are from there, so this is actually <laughs> this is perfect. Uh, Jan- crazy coincidence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's um, it's January twenty seventh. I'll be in Royersford. Very cool. Check them out. Joe List, thanks again. This song, guys, is called Feels, and it's by Lauren Faith. So we'll see awesome. you guys next week. And I'll, I'll see you soon, hopefully in New York or L.A., once this thing kind of calms down. I'll see you back would, out there. I'd love that. Thanks, man. Say hi to Sarah for me, too. Will do. All right. Take it easy, guys. Peace. Peace.